Welcome to the 403 of you who've joined us for tonight's webinar and all the viewers who are watching the podcast. MHPN wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respects to the Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. My name is Catherine Boland and I'll be facilitating tonight's very interesting session about internet gaming addiction and the effects on mental health. I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice in Sydney and I deal with families in high conflict. And I can tell you that nothing in my clinical training prepared me for the, tonight's topic. Nothing in my personal life prepared me for it either. And I'm the parent of three teenagers, so I take a very active personal interest in the topic tonight as well. Um, this evening we have the wonderful expertise of a range of professionals who are going to enlighten us on this topic. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Just a little note that uh, we've noticed that some people who've registered might think that tonight's topic is about gambling. It is about video games that people play online as outlined in the case study. So you've had a chance to read our panellists' bios and I am thrilled about the level and depth and breadth of expertise. I feel completely out of my depth with these excellent clinicians, researchers, and I have to say gaming experts. Uh, so I think you're all going to enjoy tonight's webinar. So I'd first like to go through and introduce our panelists to you. First of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sam Yong, who's a GP. Hi, Sam. Hi. Sam, can you just tell me a little bit about, in your um, youth general practice, how often you come across kids or young people who are who you consider addicted to gaming? Yeah, look, I, I don't think it's as uncommon as we think. Um, I probably see more of those kinds of patients as I work in a university clinic part-time and also tend to see younger patients. Um, but it is something that I tend to ask about as well. Um, mm. I think it's more of... Um, something that is increasing in prevalence, though, certainly, and I think it will continue to do so in the future. Mm, I certainly agree. If the last few years are anything to go by, um, thanks for that, Sam. I'd now like to introduce Vaz Stravopoulos, who is a clinical psychologist and has an expertise in this area beyond anything I've seen before. Vaz, are you undergoing any research in this area at the moment? Yes, I'm investigating uh, risk and protective factors related uh, specifically to the gaming, to the game context, and I maintain collaborations with the UK, South Korea, Greece, and uh, the US. That's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to picking your brain. I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Kim Lee, who is a psychiatrist. Uh, Kim, I know that you've recently participated in a live debate with psychiatrists on whether internet gaming disorder should be included in the DSM-5. What was the verdict? The verdict was that the audience actually got to vote on their, their smartphone. So <laughs> at the start, people were saying, yes, it should be included, a majority, and then at the end, they still agreed that it should still be an uh, included in DSM-5, but actually the opposing team managed to shift quite a lot of the audience to say that we need more research in this area. But certainly a very uh, controversial mm. uh, diagnosis and will be not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's for sure. All right, I'd like to hear more about that in your presentation, I think, a bit, Kim. Um, last but not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Hurley, who's a mental health nurse. And um, John, I want to know a little bit about the context of your work at Headspace. What are some of the typical presentations of those kids with reported internet or gaming addiction? Hi, Catherine. Um, I think that's one of the most challenging aspects about this topic of discussion is that um, on reflection of a number of years of practice at Headspace, increasingly I became aware there is not really any one typical presentation um, and that you actually do need to have a fair degree of curiosity and some skill to be able to explore with each young person as to whether there's a problem there or not. Mm, 
Well, well said. All right. Thanks so much for that. Um, I'm sure you all agree we've got a fantastic uh, group of specialists here tonight. Just a couple of things I want to go through to make sure we have a great experience. Um, first of all, just basic ground rules to help ensure that everyone has the opportunity to get the most from the webinar. Um, some technical things that might help you if you're new to this platform, as we've changed the platform somewhat. First of all, if you'd like to access the chat box, click open the chat tab on the bottom of your screen and the chat box will open in a separate window. You can also find supporting resources in the resource library tab on the bottom of your screen. If you would like some technical assistance, there is a technical support FAQs tab for help with those issues. And if you're still having difficulty, there's a number to call if you need it. Um, I'd also like at this point to give you a heads up that I will be encouraging you to give us some feedback at the end of tonight's webinar by completing the feedback survey, which is really important for us in determining future webinars. So some pretty basic things and about being respectful to one another and the panellists. Please behave as you would in a face-to-face -face activity. We'll be trying to interact with you on the, um, I will be trying to interact with you a little bit on the chat. Um, there's been a lot of questions already submitted and I encourage you to ask the panellists questions through the chat and we'll, I will try to get through as many of those as possible. Um, the other thing to let you know about is that um, we'll be going through, each of the panellists will be giving their unique perspective on the case study and I'll talk about the case study in a little minute, but uh, each of the panellists will give a particular presentation tonight and then at the end of their presentations we'll be having a panel discussion which is where we'll have the opportunity to answer some of the questions that you want to put to these panellists. So what do we hope to get out of tonight's presentation? So basically this webinar is going to give you the opportunity to recognise the clinical effects and harms to mental health related to internet gaming addiction. It will also increase your skills and understanding of managing internet gaming addiction and improve your awareness of evidence-based interventions. It will also identify strategies to engage specialist services when treating someone with internet gaming addiction. I I think that most of you have had the opportunity to come across our case study with our 15 year old uh, Jack and I was shocked in reading this at how relevant and how real and how lifelike this case study is. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing our panellists views about Jack and his situation and just on a little side note I'm also going to pick your brains panellists about Poor Jack's mum, who I think has been coerced, if I've read it correctly, into actually delivering food to his room or otherwise he refuses to eat. Um, but I think some of the questions we've already had tonight are about what are parents meant to do about these sorts of situations. So um, if, you, if you're aware of the case study, that will help guide our presentation. So I'm going to turn over now to Dr Sam Yong, who's going to give us the perspective from a GP. Thank you, Catherine. Um, yes, well, my name is Sam and thank you for having me today. Um, I just thought I would tell you a little bit about myself very quickly. Um, but just in the top right hand corner of this slide is just a picture of myself um, at the ripe old age of 17. Um, and that's just me next to my computer, um, which I spent um, a lot of time in front of. Actually, in that year of my life, I was a year 12 um, student and uh, I, I recall that I checked how many hours I'd played on this online game um, called EverQuest and it, it equated to about 1900 hours uh, which is about two months and 22 days of time that I'd spent in front of that computer there um, just between January and August of that year um, but it wasn't until I realized that I probably wasn't going to pass my year 12 exams um, or get into university that I decided to quit um, albeit for a temporary period of time. Um, but certainly that is why this is a topic that's maybe a little bit of interest to myself. Um, and I think that the prevalence will, will continue to rise. Um, we think that about two thirds of Australians actually play some form of video games pretty regularly. Um, and that the majority of households will have some sort of device that will enable people to play a computer game. Um, and the prevalence has been reported 
to be around 5 to 6% anyway here in Australia um, in terms of pathological video gaming tendencies. Um, and this picture on the bottom left-hand side is probably not something that we uh, haven't seen before. Um, it's you know maybe a picture of, of what we see in the young the younger generation now engaging in technology at a very young age. Um, and I think therefore these kinds of disorders, not only internet gaming disorder, but internet addictions and social media addictions will continue to rise um, over time. In terms of my general approach um, to this case, but also just in any case, and I know that Jack and his mother have already presented um, in this case, I think that half the issue is just identifying the fact that it is an issue in many young people. Many young people will present with other, you know, um, unrelated um, presentations, things like viral infections or immunizations. Um, and, you know, often at that time, um, in general practice, we like to perform what we know as a head assessment, um, which is just a general assessment to find out a bit about how life is going otherwise. And we tend to ask them about their home, their schooling, their general activities, um, whether or not there's any drugs involved, sexuality and depression and suicide also come to the fore. Um, but I think it's a good time to also just ask what sort of interests they, they have. And, and in general, we do find that there is an increased prevalence of people who enjoy playing internet games and some people who will be addicted to, to such an activity. Um, it's also a great opportunity to develop a bit of rapport, um, to engage patients. Um, and at this time, um, I usually ask them what sort of video games they'll be playing, what sort of platforms they're using, whether that be on their computer or something like a PlayStation or an Xbox or an iPhone. Um, I, I tend to ask them about how much they play um, and quantify their usage in terms of hours. Um, I also like to find out a bit about what motivates them to play and what the addictive properties are, whether that be the problem solving, um, you know, um, I guess properties of the games, the social aspects, um, the escape from reality, or whether or not it's the, the measurable growth or the rewards that you can have it in, in very quick time. Um, it's also a good opportunity to ask about comorbid mental health problems like depression, anxiety, or stress, and using a DAS-21 can be very helpful um, in that sort of setting. Um, and at that time, I also like to find out about whether or not there's any functional incapacity being caused in this, um, in this scenario, whether that be relationships, financial, school, work performance, or social isolation. Um, and that's something that I think we can already see in this case. In terms of managing such a patient where you might think that they might have a general, general addiction to internet gaming, um, I think it's really important to be non-judgmental and have an empathic approach um, in a case like this. Um, I tend to acknowledge the merits of video gaming um, and I guess I'm a bit biased, but uh, I think that there are many. Um, but in terms of general strategies, um, I think it's important to encourage social play, um, to play with friends or with family members. Um, some other things that parents can um, implement are to negotiate gaming as a reward for key responsibilities um, and trying to set a total gaming time per day. Um, and and I, I don't know that there is an exact number, um, but I think it is important to negotiate that between parent and child. Um, I think one, one really important aspect is to move devices out of the bedroom into social areas um, and other activities to, to take their minds and to occupy them otherwise, whether that be exercise, curricular activities, other things like mindfulness. And I think it's very important to have the parents engaged in those activities as well. I know I spoke about the fact that technology is one of the problems um, of why we're seeing increased prevalence in such um, an addiction. But I think that using technology and the resources available can be a very useful tool to patients. Um, I often refer people to a TEDx talk called Escaping Video Game Addiction. Um, and a couple of podcasts as well, which I've listed there, the Game Critters podcast um, and the Psychology of Games podcast. In terms of referring on, I think it's also helpful to engage other, um, other specialties um, and use a multidisciplinary approach in this setting. Um, and, you know, a referral to a psychologist would probably be the first port of call. Um, and you could consider using a mental health care plan in general practice if they had other comorbid mental health disorders. Um, as we spoke about, this disorder is not listed on the DSM as of yet. Um, 
we could consider cognitive behavioural therapy, and I'll leave others to discuss this a little bit further. Um, there are, of course, addiction specialists, and now there's maybe an increased interest in internet gaming as its own entity. I think you could also consider maybe getting some other people involved, like the school counsellor, um, and a referral to a psychiatrist in very difficult cases. Um, but this concludes the end of my talk, and, and thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, Sam. That was I really enjoyed, particularly watching the photo of you as a 17-year-old. I would love to pick your brains later about where you've gone on the personal journey with that. Um, I'd now like to um, hand over to um, Vass, who's going to give us the clinical psychology perspective. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, my main aim, based on uh, Zach's case, is to introduce six main points that define behavioral addictions and IDD, a case formulation conceptualization that embraces game-related factors, and to expand the understanding around massively multiplayer online games as uh, high-risk internet applications. Uh, every behavior that satisfies the following six points constitutes an addiction from an operational perspective. Tolerance, mood modification, salience, which means a specific frequency within a specific period of time, withdrawal symptoms, conflicts, and relapse. There's a continuum of social tolerance and acceptance of addictions, with substance abuse behaviors being, more, um, uh, being less underdiagnosed and uh, less socially tolerated, alcohol abuse somewhere in the middle, and behavioral addictions being potentially more socially tolerated and therefore more underdiagnosed. Uh, time is necessary, but not a sufficient criterion to define addictive use of the Internet. The aim is uh, the important criterion, why someone is there. If he or she is there to um, moderate the way he or she feels, then this constitutes a high-risk factor. What triggers Internet gaming disorder behaviors? A combination of individual and contextual factors that push the, the gamer into the world of the game, along with game-related factors that pull the gamer into the world of the game. Um, saying that, I need to highlight that uh, internet addiction behaviors and internet gaming disorder behaviors are primarily considered secondary symptoms, which aim to emotionally regulate uh, other primary symptoms such as depression and anxiety. However, they may eventually reinforce them. A drive for communication and socialization is what mainly use the, the gamers to excessively use games, leading to loneliness and isolation. And this is best conceptualized by the term internet paradox, that defines how a communication medium can uh, actually advance loneliness and isolation. Considering cyber relationships developed in the world of the games, such as the Overwatch, these are best described by, three, by two models, the AAA, anonymity, accessibility, and affordability among the players, and the ACE model, anonymity, convenience, and escapism. Uh, considering the, play, the, the games as high-risk applications, MMOs, massively multiplayer online games, comprise a system of constant rewards and reinforcements along with online socialization. And when these two coexist with a constant evolution of, uh, a, of a game character, then we have massively multiplayer online role-playing games, which tend to be more addictive. In these games, players, players assume the role of a character and take control over that character's actions and development. And a number of players can be concurrently present in the game while the game's persistent world continues to exist and evolve, while the player is offline and away from the game. It's like sharing a collective dream. In the case of Overwatch, we have the two elements, uh, online socialization and a constant system of rewards and challenges. Uh, saying that I need to, to highlight, I need to illustrate that this is exactly the mechanism that the games use to maintain the, the attraction of, uh, of the users, uh, a progressively uh, higher balance between the skills of the players and the demands of the game. In terms of our clinical formulation, case formulation, um, we usually have predisposing factors which uh, constitute involve adaptation difficulties in someone's real life, which result to feelings of discomfort and distress that eventuate excessive gaming, that is perpetuated by access to gratification and relief. And if the gamer has a level of problem awareness and a motivation to change, then we do have protective factors. And these factors are equally distributed across the real and the virtual context and can be viewed either, either as risks or resources, and risks both static and dynamic. Um, finishing my presentation, I would simply like to say that 
in terms of our case formulation and our treatment plan, we need to involve elements related to the game context and the relationship between the gamer and his persona in the world of the game, as well as the relationship between the gamer and his online group. Thank you. Wow, Vas, you have got a depth of knowledge beyond anything I could possibly imagine. I'm still trying to get my head around uh, the his, you know, problem awareness and motivation to change. I'm thinking very much like an ignoramus parent here. Um, how do how does one increase uh, a young adolescent boy like Jack in our case study his problem awareness or his motivation to change? And we might come back to that. But I'd like to hear next from Dr. Kim Lee, who's our psychiatrist, who's going to give us the point of view from psychiatry. Over to you, Kim. Thanks, Catherine. So on my journey through internet gaming disorder, at the start, I was like most of the people in the audience, are games really that addictive? And I had to go overseas to clinics in Asia to really open my eyes up on what the problem was. And if you dig deeper into the game design, you'll find out that there are Psychology 101 lessons that are being repeated uh, in gaming and now smartphones. So I've got my rat here in a Skinner box. I got this one from Ikea. But, you know, Beer Skinner was able to train any rat to press a button continuously for a reward. And he did that by randomizing the reward. So the rat never knew when the next reward was going to come. Now, game designers have been doing this for decades and randomizing the rewards to get players hooked. And if you do a quick uh, Google search on Overwatch, <coughs> even the Wikipedia link I put there for Overwatch, the game Overwatch has what's called loot boxes. So if you work hard at the game, you increase your level, you get a loot box, a reward, and you don't know what's in that box. And that, for some people, is a real draw card to get them to keep grinding out, to keep pressing the button for the next level. And if you've maxed out on the loot boxes, you can actually spend money on Overwatch, what, what are they called, uh, microtransactions. In the end, these fabulous games are designed for addiction because addiction makes money and addiction, addictive games sell. And in Jack Gamer's situation, it's, it's hard to really say, oh, he's addicted to the loot boxes, but obviously there are other rewards that are uh, very uh, rewarding for him and brings him back. And one of those key things is that he he's posting his videos online, getting comments through forums and his Facebook, and those little rewards that he's getting is big enough for him to overcome the bullying, which I think is probably an even bigger problem in this particular case, and that, that should be addressed as well just like you would in any other uh, patient that comes to see you in your clinic. So as a child psychiatrist, I'm probably seeing one new case of internet gaming addiction uh, in the CAM setting, and these are usually children who are teenage boys who are school refusing, refusing to leave their home, uh, not functioning uh, academically, socially, emotionally, and more and more I'm seeing... Uh, girls who are presenting with difficulties getting off social media. And uh, more recently, you've seen uh, lots of whistleblowers, people like uh, uh, the, one of the founders of Facebook come out to say, yes, Facebook is designed to be addictive. So what we've got now, ladies and gentlemen, is your smartphone is now designed to become your own Skinner box. So we are all giving away valuable data and information to the largest social experiment and operant conditioning laboratory in the world. And all the games now are designed to be online so they can collect that data. Now, you can use that in your practice to your benefit by asking the child uh, if they agree to log in to their Steam account and uh, you can find out objectively how many gaming hours, just like uh, what Sam mentioned when he was playing Year 12. And I see kids spending thousands of hours on one game in my clinic. So in terms of tips, very basic tips, uh, moving devices out of the bedroom. Uh, the Singaporean researchers found that if you had devices in the bedroom, you're more likely to become addicted. 
schedule activities, no matter whether I go to Singapore, Korea or Japan, all those clinics there, the patients are handing in very detailed hour-by-hour -hour, uh, programs of what they're doing in the day so that they know that they can fill in that time uh, with activities. And if there's an age classification, use it. Uh, the website Common Sense Media is a very good uh, website to use if you're, if you're a parent or a clinician trying to find out more information. And abstinence is the aim because abstinence creates awareness. And the University of Adelaide, I'll just finish up now, the University of Adelaide with Flinders University did a recent study published this year that found that if you found uh, gamers who are voluntarily wanting to quit, if you got them to stop gaming from Friday midday to Monday midday and gave their passwords to the, uh, to the, uh, the study and were not able to access the gaming, they were able to shift their negative cognitions based on their gaming, uh, their self-esteem, and reduce their gaming hours one week later and one month later. Thanks. Wow, thanks so much, Kim. That is a fantastic and amazing study. I am going to tell my 16-year-old about it when I get home tonight. The Friday lunchtime, was it? <laughs> I'll, I'll... Friday lunchtime, because Friday weekends lunchtime. are the, probably the biggest time yeah. when you're going to spend time online, so it's a big chunk. Yeah, fantastic. All right, and last but not least, again, I'd like to turn over to Dr. John Hurley, who's going to tell us about the perspective from a mental health nurse headspace. Over to you, John. Hi, that's uh, three hard talks to follow. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, this question would be the most common question that I have been asked um, at Headspace by both parents and by um, other clinicians, caused by some, um, I'm a late-life father and hence I have a teenage son and I've actually learnt a game. Um, when I thought about answering that question, I kept a few things in mind. One is that, um, as the other speakers have so well outlined, that games are made to be addictive. The second thing I kept in mind was that as a mental health profession, or across our professions, we have over the years tended to pathologise. Um, as you could probably see, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to have been around um, in the time of the DSM-3 when it was substantially thinner um, and contained things like homosexuality. So I wanted to be sort of alert that I wasn't pathologising something. And this was reinforced by meeting many young people in my clinical room that use gaming to form friendships, uh, fall in love, experience success, uh, learn leadership, learn negotiation um, and expand their social skills and, and as well as meeting others who, like our case study Jack, uh, clearly had some sort of profound problems around gaming. So as both clinician and academic, what I did is I, I um, trotted out of Headspace and, and trotted into the, um, into the literature of, of research and I did an in-depth uh, literature review and what I found pretty well reflected what was um, in my clinical environment. Uh, at what becomes immediately apparent on the left hand side of the slide there you'll see all the benefits that the research uh, indicates comes from gaming. Um, they have friendships, youth identity, um, mental health literacy, all sorts of advantages. And then on the next perspective, when we have a look at the other research evidence, we find that gaming uh, is strongly associated with decreased psychosocial function and um, exacerbation of pre-existing mental health conditions. So even going to the evidence and the research itself wasn't necessarily clarifying. What did come clear was that there was no defining diagnostic tool, there was no defining um, evidence-based clinical treatment and that's because there are very few clinical trials that are of a large number that are longitudinal. What also seems to be apparent is that we need to be alert that the evidence suggests that perhaps we need to shift our gaze away from just gaming to wider internet applications because sometimes the addictions are around what the internet supports, such as gambling, sex or social interactions. One of the key things from a mental health nursing perspective, or from any mental health perspective for that matter in terms of gaming, is this question. 
um, the question of are they running away from something or are they not? And this takes us back to this idea of pathologising something. Gaming is really, really good fun. Um, and particularly if you reach something called flow, it's just a sheer joy. This is where your skills and the game sort of meld together and one hour um, or four hours feels like one hour. So I find in clinical practice a really useful thing to do, um, as you would do with Jack, is to explore the drivers for the game. Are they actually walking towards this game for sheer enjoyment, much as one in my youth I walked towards cricket and would have spent thousands of hours doing that, or are they, in fact, running away from something such as trauma, depression, uh, parental abuse, social phobias, school bullying, and using it as a refuge? I believe that once we can accept gaming as, by the, as neither being intrinsically good or bad, uh, that we therefore will have more curiosity to be able to explore um, some possible answers to that. One of the things about um, engagement uh, around gaming is that, A, we now have emerging empirical evidence that the therapeutic alliance actually has a substantial positive impact on the, impa on the outcomes of psychological treatments. Where we, as oh, where I come in is that I can use gaming as a tool rather than obstacle. Um, I can situate the young person as being a teacher and an expert, uh, that they're accepted, and that I'm not just simply another old person telling them how to live their life. Also, being able to talk their language, the language of gaming, gives me some credibility to quite respectfully challenge perhaps the amount of hours they are spending um, on their games. Some useful things in terms of intervening. Now again, um, I looked at the evidence and tried to find something within the literature that was giving me um, two things I really wanted to go back to the first question was how many hours should I let my child play? And I looked at, at scores and scores of articles and they most often talk about moderate, extreme or small amounts of gaming but really didn't give hours in an empirical number. I sort of had a sense that it was around two hours a day, seemed to be supporting some of those positive benefits of gaming, and that beyond that seemed to be headed towards pathology, but that's very rough. Um, I found in my clinical practice that replacement rather than banning um, has been quite effective, so by filling the day up with alternative activities, there's uh, less time to play, and it also removes that confrontation. Finally, it was around also um, intervening with a social capital lens. So social capital is about how young people use gaming and the internet to add um, resources to their lives that they otherwise wouldn't have. And that if we're asking young people to stop gaming, we're asking them to stop having friendships, we're asking them to stop having excitement, to stop having fun, to stop having connectivity, or key developmental aspects to teenagers. So we also need to be mindful of that. Um, and I guess as a final message, it would just be that um, for clinicians that we should really learn about gaming um, and be more literate about um, the languages and the type of games that are out there. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, John. That was fascinating. I, you are a braver man than I venturing down the gaming with your son path, but it is a timely message for us all because I think as a clinician, I often feel, and as a parent, I feel dreadfully out of my depth with what is happening. We've had a lot of questions um, that I'm going to put pull together and put to the panel, and I <coughs> encourage you to keep writing questions on the chat um, box, and I'll try to get those questions to the panellists uh, as, as I can, although there are quite a lot of them. The elephant in the room in some way is that there are clear differences between what girls and boys or young men and young women are doing online. And I guess I'd like to ask the panellists, given that we're talking about internet gaming addiction, why is this so much of a problem for teenage boys? What's going on in the lives of boys that makes it a problem and what are the girls doing? So I'll ask um, Sam to give his perspective on this first. Yeah, so, sorry, Catherine, you just broke up there. Would you be able to just say Yeah, I'm again? just saying, what, what, what's, with the, what's with the boys? What's going wrong with boys? Why is this a boy problem? Um, and, you know, obviously girls and boys are... are approaching online gaming quite differently. I understand the prevalence rates are quite different. 
Um, I have three teenagers of different sexes in my house and I can tell you the boys are doing a lot of different things than my daughter. Why, why is that? Why, why, why boys? Yeah, look, I think that's a really good question. I'm not sure that I would definitely know being a boy myself. <laughs> um, but I think a very large proportion of people who play video games are actually female. I would agree with you that the majority are boys. And I don't know, I think it could be to do with the fact that um, it's competitive at times, internet gaming. And I think in general, females are less competitive and have that desire to beat each other or win at something. Mm. Um, you know, and I kind of think about the aspects of gaming that appeal to myself. Um, but it's also the fact that you also have very, you see very quick rewards um, in games, whether that be to achieve high scores or to obtain loot boxes, and you feel, you feel like you have very um, tangible rewards um, very quickly, um, and that seems to be something of a lot of interest, um, but also because it's a very easy way to socialise, um, and I, I recall that even from a young age, it was an easy way to meet people on the internet and to befriend people and to find an activity that you could potentially uh, do with other people and get to know them at the same time. And maybe that's something that boys have a little bit more difficulty doing, um, finding something to occupy them with other young mm -hmm. boys, whether that, you know, and maybe that's why we're out in the yard, maybe kicking the ball or throwing a ball or running around and girls are sitting around having a chat and socialising maybe in a bit more of a mature fashion. Yeah, it, it's such a it's such an interesting area. I think you know one of the other things I've noticed with my sixteen year old son is he will a hundred percent socialise on Friday and Saturday nights with online gaming. I'm not sure what my teenage daughter is doing would be considered socialising. It's definitely using social media, not internet gaming. But and and that's a whole other webinar topic about what girls are doing online, I suppose. Um, Kim, what do you think about this? About the the vulnerabilities of boys in particular to um, gaming addiction? Sure. I guess you've got to look at the Department of Health national statistics that came out a few years ago, and they found that actually girls had more addictive problems with the internet and electronic gaming use. So they, that particular study, they combined both internet and electronic games, and although boys played more games, girls were experiencing more difficulty controlling their internet use. And... Although I, Although, see, I see, uh, girls, sorry. Although I see uh, girls playing games uh, in my clinic, generally it's all about marketing and money in the end. And, oh, my webcam's not up. Um, it's all about marketing. And, you know, if you go in the playground on the oval, there's a lineup of boys playing British Bulldogs and the girls might be sitting around talking or playing... Um, a game that's safe for them and uh, essentially the games at the moment they're designed in a way that uh, is exciting and, and games that are violent are exciting and uh, there are some theories that uh, there's a strong link between ADHD and internet gaming problems and the exciting games are the violent games so that stimulates the child with ADHD and we know that there are more boys with ADHD and more and more in my practice I'm seeing children with autism suffering from difficulties using their iPad or electronic games. Mm, that's uh, well, actually one of the people on the chat was asking a little bit about autism spectrum disorders and, and gaming so I'm glad you, glad you touched on that. Vaz, what do you think about the gender difference here in prevalence rates or why, how girls and boys approach um, gaming? Okay, I have, I have three points to highlight. First, from a research perspective, we do know that, um, that those who present with internet gaming disorder symptoms tend to be uh, more boys. However, when we have females presenting with ITD, their symptoms are stronger and higher. The clinical cases tend to be more severe. Mm -hmm. That's the first point. The second point has to do with the fact that in every form of addiction, males tend to prevail. And the common denominator uh, when it comes to addictive behaviors is the lack of relationships. Mm. It's what we call you know, it's the main addictive function, one of the main addictive functions. And when it comes to cyber relationships, what has been suggested is that males 
are more prone to be addicted to them because from a social perspective um, are more limited than females in expressing their feelings, either feelings of anger or feelings of um, attachment and proximity. Um, and, the, and the third point has to do with the fact that until now uh, we haven't had what we call measurement invariant studies because there is the possibility that boys and girls address the same questionnaires that assess the prevalence in a different way. So the same scores may indicate a different level of severity. And the only study that has been published assessing that thing um, is an Italian study in 2017. And there are more to come. So it has been recommended that we need more measurement invariant studies to be, to be sure about the extent of the difference of the prevalence between boys and girls. But overall, it's cyber relationships. Yeah, right. It's very interesting. And just male patterns of addiction in general, um, you, you're reminding me of things that, of course, we know, but it's, it's it, just such a different way that girls and boys at pre-adolescence and adolescence tend to approach these things. All right. I, I want to just turn our attention now to some other questions that are coming through. And some of the people are asking us, what are the particular risk factors that would make someone more vulnerable to online gaming addiction? And can those risk factors be identified earlier in childhood? Um, so anyone want to, uh, anyone got a burning desire to sort of have a go at this one? I'll have to direct you. So I'm going to get you to answer it, Sam. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, you know, in terms of risk factors for, um, for gaming, I, I'd say certainly... Um, social isolation um, is one um, because I think that there is that um, ease of socializing I mean engaging other people in such an activity and working towards a common goal um, I think that also uses a distraction so often you know people who actually have other things that they need to do whether it be students who need to do homework or people who need to work on something in particular will use it as a form of distracting themselves, and I think that's a big risk factor. So, sorry, um, just interrupt, Sam, you, you mean procrastinating? It's, a, it's just yeah, a I, convenient I procrastination. Yeah, I think it so, is a form right. of procrastination. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's, very e it's, it's very easily accessible as well nowadays. Um, it is so easy to log on and to click onto a game and then to engage yourself for a good one hour or two or more. Mm. Um, and I think that that is, that is something that is... That is why it's, it's much more fun than homework, let's face it. Of course. <laughs> of course. Um, all right. John, do, why do you think, what, what do you think the factors are that would be risk factors for, for a particular child? Look, I think we've probably um, touched on all of us um, tonight that there's, there's a lack of really clear, undisputable evidence that's actually directing us towards this. Um, what seems to be a pattern or, or, or themes emerging is that, um, particularly in young people, it's the young person who's a bit different. Um, the young person who, uh, perhaps because they're a bit different, are being bullied at school or they feel judged by their peers and they feel disconnected from other young people who are also a bit different. And mm -hmm. so the gaming platforms tend to be a safe place for those kids who aren't the norm or who, who step a little bit outside of the norm um, and it's a safe environment for them to be in uh, where, for those of you, I don't know um, how old we, we all are in terms of when we all last walked through a high school playground, uh, they can be sometimes intimidating, rowdy, noisy places uh, and these platforms are a safe refuge for those not to be judged. Mm, mm, yeah, great. All right, Vaz, what do you think? Are there, are there research, um, is there any research into understanding what particular children um, uh, are, are at risk of this? What the person, interpersonal characteristics of those children are? Um, yes, there is, there is research in terms of uh, personality traits, those who tend to be more introvert, mm -hmm. those who tend to be more open to experience, um, and those who tend to be less agreeable appear to be at high risk. Those who suffer pro from a, a comorbid form of psychopathology uh, and they tend to use gaming as a maladaptive emotion regulation strategy. But the important thing in terms of research 
is, uh, is the emphasis on contextual factors. So paradoxically, it has been found that when we have more gamers in the same classroom, then the, ga then the game pattern is not addictive because they, they use the game as an extension of their socialization in reality. Just, so just, can I just slow you down again? I, I just want to make sure I've understood it right. So you're saying that if there are multiple players online, it, it becomes less addictive? What has been found, and it's very interesting, is that when we have a higher percentage of gamers within the same classroom, then the game itself becomes a mean of uh, socialization. It's like they, they do all the same thing and they, they, they end up socializing through that. It's, it's, a, it's a form of social compliance. Uh -huh. A risk factor, a main risk factor, has to do with isolated player, uh -huh. uh, isolated gaming from someone's real context. I see. And I would, I would also highlight something which is very important. There's a paradox with the internet gaming disorder as a form of addiction. While in general, the prevalence of other forms of addictions tends to be higher in more individualistic and westernized cultures. When it comes to internet gaming disorder, the prevalence tends to be higher in more collectivistic and less, um, and less westernized countries like mm -hmm. Korea or China. Mm -hmm. and the way that this has been explained is the need of belonging. So the gamers be, end up belonging in a social group and they, 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 they connect to it that strongly that they cannot disengage from the game. So if someone doesn't have a group to belong in reality, he or she is likely to substitute this, um, this deficit online through the world of the game. And this is possibly the most important risk factor. Mm. That's absolutely fascinating. I, I uh, could spend a lot of time talking to you about this. Uh, Kim, what do you think? What's your perspective about the um, you know, individual risk factors? Yeah, well... In the uh, Singaporean Addiction Clinic that I worked in, uh, we did a study on the data that we had coming through, and the highest risk factor was uh, comorbid ADHD. Mm. Also, a lot of children who had uh, comorbid uh, major depression, and we, I think, uh, the, one of the biggest risk factors is parents buying these games and not really having a clue. <laughs> that these games could be addictive. And, mm. you know, the, we're reaching a tipping point where people are waking up to this and realising that, hey, there's something happening here and it's not quite right. And, you know, last week we had Sean Parker, one of the founders of Facebook, come out publicly and say, yeah, we, we programmed Facebook to be addictive. And it's no wonder that Facebook is uh, one of the top five largest companies in the world. and we need to educate the public that there are risks involved in giving your child, very young children, games and games that are not age appropriate. Mm. That, that, that's, that's so true. So I actually want to turn our attention a little bit to prevention and also some of the challenges we get, not just with the young people who come into your practices or our practices, but also their parents who might be, be presenting with distressed because of what is happening in the household, as is the case in our case study. I guess, again, coming from the position of a quite ignorant person about this, do gamers actually know how much they are playing? You, all of you have talked a little bit about the importance of gamers becoming aware of um, how much they are online. Um, first of all, do gamers actually know, do parents know, and how can we increase the awareness of this, what seems to be a pretty important factor in um, increasing motivation for any treatment or intervention? Anyone can have a go at telling me this. Do gamers know how much they're gaming? Do problem gamblers know how much time they're spending in a casino? Well, they usually know how much money they're spending at some point because there's a bank balance that that goes down. And I just wonder, I don't know, I really don't know. Do you know? You, I think, um, I think there was a you know fantastic sort of description of going through how many hours it played on something. But do gamers actually look that stuff up? I don't know. I want to know. Well, for some people, they would look it up as a sort of sign of pride or you know, dedication, which is a, a great thing. But, you know, what about another question? How much time should you spend on your holiday going overseas? Mm. 
because uh, what I, the way I see uh, games is it's essentially another world and you're spending time in that world. And, you know, we'd all love to spend, you know, months on end in Bali relaxing, but there's a real world out there and it's back in Adelaide or back in Sydney or Melbourne. And that's the truth of it. Um, if you want to let your child spend their time in a world where there's no rules and uh, people aren't accountable for what they do or what they say or bullying or how much money they spend on their grandparents' credit card, then, yeah, I mean, <laughs> these are all things that we got to wake up to. Mm, true. All right. Um, Vas, do, do gamers know how much they're playing and, and how can we increase awareness of that? Okay. I think uh, there are two levels of awareness. The, um, let's say the short time, the on-time awareness, while, while, while they are gaming, which mm -hmm. is not there, because as John very wisely said, they are absorbed by the context of the game uh, and the activity in the game uh, due to online flow. Mm -hmm. So they are not aware while they are playing, while they are gaming, but they have delayed awareness. They know they have a healthy voice, a reflective voice inside them. And what I usually do when, uh, when I treat cases of ITD is uh, to ask them whether there is a voice inside them that tells them that there is something wrong there. And this healthy voice is the voice that we ally with and we aim to empower during therapy. Because there is a, a, a contradiction, there is a discrepancy between what they know that it is right to be done and the way they actually act. And, 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 and this discrepancy needs to be treated. We need to empower the healthy part of their self, which is there, in a delayed way, in a delayed time, if I make sense. Mm, mm. That's, that absolutely makes sense. All right. Uh, uh, some of our um, panelists are asking a little bit about parents and what some strategies are for parents. So I'd like to ask every one of the panelists to, to help us out here and to tell us some practical strategies for parents about how to enforce shut-off times for the internet access or to empower parents managing this problem. I think I facetiously said earlier that Jack's mother has somehow been complicit in bringing his dinner to his room because he refuses to eat otherwise. But what can parents do? I'm not sure that parents are going to be able to replicate that university study and um, take passwords off kids at lunchtime on Friday. But could we have the panel's expertise on what practical strategies parents can do to help their kids? Over to anyone. I think... Um, hi. Um, it's really important not to uh, separate the child from the rest of the family system and at the same time from the other life tasks that an adolescent is facing. Um, we too often tend to try and treat people in isolation from their wider family system. So I think part of it would be that there is no magic answer. Um, every young person I see is quite individual, quite unique. Their circumstances and the parenting are quite individual and quite unique as well. What does seem to work is open, honest communication. Um, in terms of the parents and the children and it being non-confrontational. Mm. When you look at one of the key developmental tasks of any adolescent is to differentiate themselves from their parents. And so gaming becomes the focal point of what's actually normal developmental psychology. But then it gets mired and murked up um, in this gaming issue. So it's about one of the key things I do is get the parents in the room, usually as many of the family members in the room as possible. Um, and that's not always easy with our funding systems. Um, and try and at least promote that open communication. Mm. Mm. Seems to be a common sort of theme. All right, other panellists, what practical strategies can you um, give parents to help their kids? Gumtree. Who is that? I, I, I said Gumtree. Oh yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> I often say to parents, you know, why don't you just put GTA 5 disc on Gumtree? And sometimes <laughs> once I had this eight-year-old boy tell me, I don't care if you sell that game. I'm just going to go to cash converters and buy it for $5. And, you know, these kids are savvy. They, um, But, you know, it comes down to values and uh, family <laughs> values and 
parents have to put their foot down at some stage and mm. say, look, I understand you're really into this game, but we actually value your time and uh, we want you back in our lives. And sometimes that sinks, sinks in, sometimes it doesn't. And mm. if you need a professional to help you out with that, then uh, seek help. Mm. I mean, I, in our case study, I noticed Jack is sort of sneaking his parent. He seems to have eclipsed his parents in his technical skills. He's, he's, you know, obviously waiting till they've crashed out at night. He's staying up at night. He's doing it in these surreptitious ways. I guess that would be pretty common um, for, you know, most of us who have teenage children do not have the technical skills that they have, particularly once they hit higher adolescent years. So... How would you bring around a family like Jack's where he's sneaking around doing this sort of stuff at night or behind the parents' backs, so to speak? Yeah, I... I yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Sam. Um, yeah, um, yeah, look, I was just thinking this, about this uh, scenario, scenario and, and, and I think it's a, it's a very like, difficult one. Um, I think um, certainly, certainly, you know, one of the big things that, that I promote and people who have this kind of problem would be to move any gaming devices such as the computer into areas where everyone is around. Like I, I think mm -hmm. having them in the bedroom is definitely something that, you know, where, where, where someone can game guilt free mm -hmm. and not have to do it in front of their parents. Um, I think some of the other tips that I often will have to parents are, you know, trying to set a bit of an example. We know that, you know, and I'm just as guilty as anyone, um, is, is we spend a lot of time on our phones, on technology nowadays. And I think children and adolescents are very perceptive of that and will follow those kinds of behaviours. And I think it's very hard to tell an ad adolescent one thing but do another. Um, and so that's one thing I would definitely recommend is trying to decrease screen time for the adults um, as well as a general tip. And, and that's probably a better way to engage their children and to, to form sort of um, good social habits and, and other activities of interest as well. Yeah, that's true. All right, I want to move on to another area of interest for, um, that people have written in about, and that is therapies and effective treatments. So we might start with you, Vas. What are the evidence-based treatments for internet gaming addiction, and how effective are they? Uh, we don't have many, many studies published. What we do know... There is, there's a, an Asian study, I don't remember the country, which talks about reality therapy and specific questions mm -hmm. about raising awareness. Um, there, there is, um, there is um, the French approach, which is not evidence-based, practiced by Tisseron, who says, um, resurrect the avatar, bring the gamer's persona uh, into real life. So what gives pleasure to the gamer inside the game needs to be... Um, to find a way to, to, to fit in the real world. But hang on, um, hang on. Well, just sorry, I mean, I am really speaking from an ignorant perspective. What if the game, what gives the game a pleasure is sort of, you know, violent actions and some of the things that I worry about in, in gaming? How, how, do, how does that work in this sort of therapy? Um, I think we need, to, we need to think of aggression as a, as a, as a, as a form of, a, of an acting out behavior. And mm -hmm. of course, tension can be expressed in reality in, in more allowed or more elaborated ways. But the gamer himself or herself needs to be able to live part of his or her gaming life in his or her real life. And this is, this is probably the most important thing. So who he is or who she is in the world of the game needs to be brought uh, into, into, into reality, mm. according to Tisseron in France. And the, the other highlight which is uh, practiced by a center in the U.S. called Restart, which is famous for the treatment of internet addiction and internet gaming disorders, has to do with group therapy. So what they are saying basically is that um, individual treatment helps someone to address issues in his or her relationship with himself or herself. But when it comes to internet gaming disorder, which is basically caused by difficulties in relationships in real life, we need group therapy. Mm -hmm. and progressively uh, tightened boundaries. So initially, the, gamer themse the gamers themselves are not able to, uh, to activate 
the level of control that they would like to have had in their lives, and they need external boundaries. Progressively, they establish a level of control, and they, they need to grow relationship-wise, and they need, they need groups. Mm. So it's a necessity. When it comes to internet gaming disorder cases, group therapy is a necessity. When, you, when, you, when we, we facilitate groups of gamers, it's, it's, it's very different to other forms of addictions because they tend not to speak, not to talk, and the easiest way to start them talk is through introducing their online personas, through right. their nicknames. Mm-hmm. Within the group therapy, you get them talking. Yes, this is, this, right. is, this, is, this is the initial stage, practice, practice both in France, in, in, in Italy, Polyclinical Gemelli, and in Greece, Athens. This is, this mm-hmm. is what we do. But unfortunately, these three countries lack into evidence-based approaches. <laughs> we need to publish more. Yeah, yeah. That's such a shame. It's, it's, a, it's such a. It seems so relevant to what you're talking about, and such a uh, really need to get the empirical studies in, in involved Place. in that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, great. That's so helpful, Kim. What do you think about effective treatments? Uh, I can tell you that there are many ineffective treatments, such as <laughs> Chinese uh, boot camps, and right, uh, they're yes. quite sort of paramilitary boot camps. What do they actually uh, do? What do, what do they just? I, I tried to go there, but they're very tight. The Chinese about oh. letting you into the country, and but uh, uh, there are some interesting things being done in Korea. They're doing things like transcranial direct stimulation, those mm-hmm. kinds of things, uh, and. Is there any evidence for that? Any evidence? In terms of randomized controlled trials, no. Um, But, you know, gamers are actually using these techniques and buying them off eBay and enhancing their brains by using these machines themselves. Wow. Uh, But in terms of uh, actual, uh, I think it comes back down to abstinence, no matter which country I go to. And in Singapore, they found that a, a reduction in gaming time improve your depressive symptoms and improve your uh, actual mental health. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, I mean... The old abstinence thing. I mean, is there any, Sam, is there any uh, yes. any effective medication? People are, are sort of quite interested to uh, know that. So the, other, the other thing I was going to say with, in terms of this case, in, in terms of Jack Gaynor's case, is that he's quite motivated to become a professional. Mm. And he needs to be a bit more realistic about that. And I'd have a sit down and, and chat with him about the chance of him becoming an Olympic athlete is actually higher than him becoming an esports <laughs> athlete. <laughs> and esports is essentially a billion dollar industry marketed by the actual companies themselves to glamorize gaming and make this seem like a professional thing. And the, the weird thing is, is that everyone's jumping on it. You've got Harvard colleges sponsoring teams, we've got Adelaide Crows who lost the grand final this year, sponsoring an esports team, mm-hmm. spending six-figure sums because they know that there's a big money in this. Mm. And we've got to wake up to uh, the fact that, you know, the other, the other day I, I met an Olympic athlete, an actual Olympic athlete, right. and they actually take Sundays off mm-hmm. to rest. The, the weird thing about gaming is, is that kids and gamers, adults, they can spend huge amounts of time and not feel fatigued. Mm. They can they have a huge appetite for time spent online, and that's within the game design. The game design never makes you feel full. Yeah, it's the perfect storm, perfect skin a box, as you know, as we've as we've heard. Uh, yeah. All right, I'm I'm, I'm conscious of time, and I, what I want to do is spend the next couple of minutes, five minutes or so, just coming back to each of our panelists and get, get them to give their sort of key messages about internet gaming addiction, where they think this is going, and what the sort of key messages for clinicians, um, parents or gamers themselves dealing with this issue uh, are. So we'll go back in order. I'll start with you, Sam. What are the key messages you think you'd like our participants to go away with tonight? Yeah, look, I think from a general practice point of view, uh, I think trying to increase awareness uh, in general practice and trying to at least ask about the issue and identify the fact that it's an issue is something that would be a good start. Um, And, you know, certainly I think the prevalence will increase as the younger population is exposed to increasing levels of internet and technology um, and also our increasing awareness of this disorder as well. Um, I think in terms of just, you know, key management strategies, 
you know, I, I definitely am a big advocate of moving moving these devices out into social areas, trying to restrict use and, and trying to, uh, I guess, come to a negotiation about trying to spend a limited time per day, um, but also replacing, um, you know, that activity with other interests and other activities um, that you can perform as a family. And I think those are some good um, strategies to have. It's also important to involve others, as I said. Um, I think someone, you know, you asked about medication therapy, and certainly to date, I'm not aware of any successful um, cases of medications being used for this disorder in isolation, and I'm not sure that I've found any evidence that that would be useful. Mm. Mm. Okay, yeah, thanks, Sam. That's uh, that's incredibly helpful. Um, all right, Vass, I might ask you to just give us your summation of the key messages for our participants tonight. Okay, I, I will start from the last medication. What we do know is that we have what we call cross-addictive behaviors. So if someone has a tendency to behave addictively, this tendency can transform from one form of addiction into another. And what is officially recommended with uh, clients who present with behavioral addiction symptoms, including internet gaming disorder, is not to be medicated very easily because they can develop, it is likely for them to develop uh, a form of legal substance-related addiction based on their medication. That's okay. the first thing. The second point is a rather optimistic point. Research-wise, what we do know about excessive gaming is that it tends, from longitudinal studies between 16 and 18, is that it tends to drop over time during that time. So it could mm -hmm. be a developmental trajectory between 16 and 18. So it, and, sorry, it peaks at 16 and then by the time a young person is 18, it sort of dropped off a little. Yes, yeah. and it's, it's, it's quite similar to Sam's case, very interestingly. Mm -hmm. So it could be a developmental trajectory related to differentiation needs from the parents that will dissipate over time. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that we do know is that it tends to be more intensive the first year of involvement of a gamer with a game, mm -hmm. and it tends to dissipate after. So for parents and families, don't be, they, they should be less worried if the, the symptoms present to be intense between uh, before the age of 18 mm -hmm. and and after the first year of involvement with an internet game uh, but if they maintain medication wise they need to be very very cautious both mm -hmm. practitioners and parents and 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 uh, treatment wise relationships we need to work with uh, decreasing push factors so have more in inviting relationships in real life and decreasing pull factors, relationships within the world of the game. An important thing is for all of us to ask the gamers, who are they in the world of the game? What is the feeling of the meaning that they have uh, within their game team? And, um, and, and, and to, to compare that with who they are in reality and how, how, how much they feel they matter about their social groups in real life. Right, great. Okay, thanks, Bass. Um, Kim, what, just a couple of key highlights for you that you'd like our participants to come home with. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, being the psychiatrist on the panel, I should probably comment on medication. Yes. <laughs> uh, whether I would prescribe Jack Gamer uh, medication, probably not. I think uh, we need to address some of the face-to-face -face bullying in the school, which I often get involved in. Here in, in Adelaide, we've uh, had quite a significant stint of cyberbullying happening in schools in mm. my area. Mm. Um, it's been quite widely publicised, actually. Um, and uh, the Carly Ryan Foundation are making legal sort of changes to the law where to ban cyberbullies from social media, which is a, uh, an amazing step forward. Uh, have I prescribed medication for kids in similar situations for Jack Gamer? I mean, if he uh, was socially anxious about going to school, had uh, depressive symptoms that he thought life was not worth living, and mm. actually one of the key factors to look out for is people who actually don't actually enjoy playing the game anymore. Right. It's, it's back to that love-hate relationship, the dopamine, the same thing, doesn't give you that same level of enjoyment anymore. And if you're playing this game, grinding it out just 
for the pure thing that's habitual, then you might, you know, consider some medications. And um, the only thing for other sort of people who can prescribe in the forum is just to be mindful that if you are starting an SSRI, a serotonin type antidepressant, uh, it can increase impulsivity and uh, you'll find them compulsively spending money or things like that. So they're the kind of things you want to watch out for. So, you know, the usual go low, go slow kind of yeah. and, and psychological therapy. Right. Great. Excellent messages. All right, John, what are your take-home messages for our participants? Um, in echoing some of what uh, Vass was saying, um, I think there's uh, uh, the first message is don't panic. Um, a, a, a lot of this over time does most certainly improve. Mm. Um, as terms of the intervention, um, we have a very powerful one, which is the way that we relate with the uh, person involved in the therapeutic alliance within that. And mm. we can use that as a platform to help to guide them towards building a life that's actually more reflective of their wider needs than just their gaming needs alone. Mm. Um, and that's about building their self-awareness about what else they might want from their life, both now and going into the future. And very often, particularly young adolescents, don't know that. And so um, mm. some patience. Um, some patience and some hang in there time. <laughs> very important. Very important when parenting adolescents in general, I would say, wouldn't you, John? It <laughs> is. It is. Hang in there. Hang in there and, and uh, make sure they know that um, you as a parent are on their team, that yeah. you're on their side. Yeah. Um, uh, there definitely isn't a quick fix, that's for sure. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, and that means that sometimes the parents need support. Um, for sure. Possibly more so than the young person. I think that's actually a really, a really good point, John. I think that's certainly true in the, you know, the clinical practice I've seen. So, um, great, great ideas there. I have so appreciated that. And I guess that brings us to the end of our uh, webinar this evening. And coming. What's really struck me as so important in fearing a lot about internet gaming is it really comes back to the very basic things that clinicians know. We were hearing tonight about the importance of interpersonal relations, about the parent-child dynamics, about getting the games out of the bedroom and into social situations and the incredibly interesting work that Vass was telling us about, about sort of drawing from the person's experience as a gamer into their, bringing that into their real life. So the very basic things we know about human psychology and psychiatry are as relevant here, even though for those of you like me who don't know much about internet gaming, those issues are, are still the same. So I'd like to, first of all, thank you all for your participation in tonight's webinar and for those of you who are very active on the chat room. I'd like you to or invite you to um, join future MHPN webinars um, and just as a bit of a teaser for what's coming up in 2018, we'll be continuing the BPT, BB, B, Bipolar Disorder uh, series in February and have topics in 2018 that will cover prostate cancer, oppositional defiant disorder, impulse control disorder, as well as better access to telehealth webinar. Um, and what I would also like to encourage you to complete the feedback survey before you log out. So if you click on the feedback survey tab at the bottom of your screen, it will open the survey. To also let you know, you will get a certificate of attendance within four weeks. And every participant will be, sent a link, will be sent a link to the online resources which are associated with this webinar, again, within four weeks. And what I'd also like you to do is uh, remember that MHPN supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, share tips and resources and build local referral pathways and engage in um, professional development activities. So if you're interested in setting up your own network or special interest group or joining an existing one, you can contact MHPM or indicate your interest on the exit survey. So again, please fill out the survey. And before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who've lived with mental illnesses in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Once more, thank you to everyone for your participation this evening and thank you to our panellists. Good evening. <laughs>